Good evening all, and welcome. There's someone just a few cubicles away. Their head has just gone down. If you peek up now, you might see their hair is ruffled. They've been watching you. They've been stalking you. Or have they? It could just be my imagination, am I right? Or am I wrong? Who knows? Tonight, we're gonna delve into the horrors of workplace stories. Some creepy stuff certainly happens when you're most focused. So it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This happened in 2009. I was 24 and worked as an office manager in one of the sub companies of a big architecture and design consortium. We had regular staff in the office and more designers and engineers working on the various construction sites the company was building. So they would only come to the office at the end of the workday or around paycheck time. Besides my other duties, I was also in charge of their work schedule. So naturally when they would come, it would be me who they'd interact with most often. Most of the engineers were a bunch of middle aged seasoned men with a bit of a raunchy sense of humor, but harmless nonetheless. Then there was this new guy, Boris, who transferred from another city. He was in his 50s and different than the rest, but looked rather well kept for someone his age, kind of dignified and very well mannered. He was a dead ringer for the actor Sam Elliott, which instilled even more of a respectful attitude towards him. The man was extremely polite. His jokes were not cynical. And on top of that, he recently became a grandfather as his son had a baby daughter. He was also very proud and happy about it and would always talk about her and show pictures every time he visited the office. Everyone liked him and I felt safest around him because he never made me feel like a piece of meat, unlike his colleagues. The project he was appointed to had foreign investors. So on the site worked an interpreter in her 30s. Her name was Vera. She was very friendly too. And even though we didn't often get to see each other in person like with the rest of the office colleagues, we would always be joking around whenever we had any interactions over the phone or via email. Before the official Christmas party, one evening the engineers came around closing time and Vera was with them. It was one of those casual and relaxed times in the office, not only because it was the end of shift, but with the holidays being near, it created that chill, friendly atmosphere. Boris was especially excited and suggested we go for drinks in some pub nearby. Because spontaneous gatherings like that don't often happen, then there's no better time than now. Despite his convincing arguments, everyone else was busy and declined. But I felt bad for him because I knew he was alone as his family was back in his hometown. So in the end, it was just me, Vera and him. It was snowing heavily outside and we ended up in a rather dingy looking pub close to the office building. Initially, the evening was fun. We laughed a lot discussing some work related events and sipping red wine. However, as it progressed, I started to feel more and more uncomfortable. Because Boris, whom up till now I thought of as a father figure, usually so well mannered and respectful, was giving off a very different vibe. Now, he was decidedly flirty, the more he drank, the more aggressively he expressed it. What started with him staring at me with a rather predatory grin in his eye and giving me compliment after compliment completely out of context progressed into him somehow turning every conversation into a sexual innuendo and a way to show me how attractive he finds me asking me questions about my personal life. I said I wanted to leave and stood up starting to gather my things when he playfully took my hand but squeezed it so hard that my rings bit into my skin and it hurt me. 
He was trying to convince me to stay. And when it didn't work, they both decided to leave with me. Once we were out and started walking, the Christmas lights, decorations and the streets bustling with people helped him convince us to go to one more pub just for a while longer, because the night was young. And it was not often that we all got to go out the drinks with colleagues. I should have listened to my gut and refused. But instead, I let myself be convinced and agreed with a plastered friendly smile on my face. Because back then, I was so out of my element in this situation. I didn't really know how to react. I was afraid of direct confrontation and frankly uncomfortable and ashamed. The second pub was even darker than the first. We picked a table on the second floor near the terrace, looking onto the first. There was nobody around. He sat across from me this time and he had no qualms to openly stare down my chest. Even though I remember I was still wearing my work clothes, which are rather conservative. I was biding my time, hoping we could leave soon, and at least calm that I was not alone. Because Vera was there too. Although she was kind of tipsy and giggly and seemed oblivious to my discomfort at his constant hints and innuendos. Then she got up and went to the restroom. Boy, did I cringe hard then. My whole body tensed when he suddenly stood up and sat next to me, put his arm at the back of my chair and told me in a lustful voice, come to my place tonight. I want you so badly. I almost dropped my wine glass. I froze feeling trapped because I was between the wall and him. I didn't know how to react. I didn't have the guts to be flat out rude to him. So instead, I nervously giggled and said, Oh, well, I'm flattered, but I can't do that. He seemed to take it as me merely playing hard to get. So he upped the ante and caressed my hair, leaning even closer, whispering to me, Come, I promise to make you feel incredibly good. I know how to please a beautiful girl like you. And then licked his lips suggestively. I almost puked. I tried to gently push him away from me, but he didn't move until Vera came back from the restroom in what felt like hours later. But it was probably a mere five minutes. When I saw her, I felt both relieved yet also ashamed because of what she would think when she saw him so intimately close to me in her absence. I suddenly jumped up so quickly, I pushed my wine glass and spilled the rest of it on the tablecloth. I declared I wanted to go home and didn't care if they were ready or not. They protested, but in the end agreed to go with me because it was late and I wouldn't be alone outside. Frankly, I just wanted to get as far away from him as possible. But there he was acting like nothing happened, helping me with my coat like the perfect gentleman, without me being able to protest, as he was the first to the coat rack. And when I had my coat on, once again, he used the moment to lean into my ear from behind and whisper, Come, please come with me. I'm hard for you all evening. And pressed himself enough for me to feel proof of his words. I started climbing down the stairs, and the chilly winter air felt like a relief. There were no taxis in sight, so I was forced to walk to the bus stop with the two of them, her chattering obliviously on the other side of me, and him constantly pulling at my hand or touching me, trying to get my attention and mouth, come with me, secretly, if I looked at him. When we reached the bus stop, the bus that came first was that of Vera, so it meant I would have to remain alone with him. Instead, I decided to catch the bus and then get off at the next stop and call a taxi. He didn't expect me to go with her though, so he made one last attempt to grab my hand and make me stay, but I pulled it away and got on the bus. When the doors closed, I started shaking and felt like crying. I told Vera what happened. But to my dismay, she was rather dismissive, saying that he's a good looking man for his age and I could have had a bit of fun. Then she admitted that he was always talking about me 
and all the other engineers at the construction site were aware of his crush on me. They were even teasing him about it. She said that he actually wanted to organize such an evening of going out as a pretext to get me alone at some point and try his luck. I felt disgusted. Even more disgusted when the text messages started. He professed his obsession with me. He was pleading with me to agree to at least meet him one on one for drinks and that he didn't want to scare me. This lasted a week or so before I realized I could just block his number. Although I was dreading the inevitable next time we would meet in the office. I confided in another colleague from the office who also happened to be the niece of the big boss. And this time I was taken seriously, especially after I showed her the messages. I didn't see him the whole week. Then after the holidays, I learned he'd gone back to his hometown. Not sure what exactly happened and whether or not he quit or was sacked. But to my relief, I'm glad I never saw or heard from him again. This happened roughly three years ago, when I was working for a small nonprofit for mental health in Little Rock. I no longer work there, so I feel more comfortable sharing this. And honestly, sharing this was quite cathartic. So here it goes. Our organization is statewide, but our HQ was quite small. At the time, there were only three of us working at that office. When this all went down, only my boss and I were in. We were already quite stressed out because we had learned just days earlier that a recently fired board member had been stalking my boss. She doesn't get scared easily, as our job had us interacting with people who have done some seriously disturbing things, but this sufficiently creeped her out. So I was hyper protective, definitely to a fault. Luckily, I had my work cut out for me, as the whole building and complex had cameras at every angle that our landlord checked regularly. It was around two in the afternoon, and the day had slowed down considerably. I took the opportunity to clean my office since I could never keep it organized for long. Once I'd filled up two massive trash bags worth of junk and old papers, I decided to step outside and make the short walk to take the trash out. When I say our organization is tiny, I'm talking we take out our own trash and clean up our entire building up. Tiny. I knew what my boss's stalker looked like and was fully prepared to deal with him should he be on the premises. Our front door was kept locked, and I locked it back up as soon as I stepped outside. My head was on a swivel. If I could have turned my head like an owl, I undoubtedly would have. I knew I could mop the floor with this guy should he try anything, but I wasn't about to go searching for him. Looking out for my boss was my goal. On the way back to the office, I was happy to see only employees from the other offices outside. I turned the left corner towards my office door, unlocked it and stepped inside. But before I could close the door, someone was directly behind me and said with impatience, I'm here to get Michael. Where's Michael? He said it so fast, I didn't immediately register what he'd just said. I'd actually jumped out in shock. How the hell did the man get behind me so quickly? All the cars in the parking lot were our cars and my spidey senses were flaring up. I'm six foot tall, and this man was right up there with me in height. He looked super thin, which is a lot coming from me, but he looked intense, frustrated. It was the beginning of fall, and he had a big jacket on, and a do-rag, clothing one rarely wears when it's still 80 degrees outside. He gave no regard for personal space, so I had to back away from him, causing him to come even further inside. Noticing this, I stood my ground. I told him that nobody named Michael works here, and that we're not a service provider. And that was clearly the last thing he wanted to hear, because it only pissed him off. He raised his voice. I know one of you has Michael. Where the hell is he? All I could say to him is that I had no idea who Michael was. And I asked him if he was lost, how old he was, 
and what Michael looked like, but none of these questions received a reply. I was just over there, pointing to another facility just a stone's throw to the east, and they told me the same thing. I know he's here. Why are you giving me all these lies? The man was enraged. My efforts to calm him down were ineffective at best, and I started getting frustrated myself, but that feeling quickly turned to concern when I saw the grip of a handgun sticking out his jacket pocket. Everything clicked. I finally understood what I was 90% sure I was dealing with. It also hit me that I was trapped. He was standing in the way of our exit. My boss could have exited through the back door, but she was in her office and didn't know what was going on. I wasn't about to make a mad dash to the exit and leave her. My only option was to fight back. If it came down to that, I took a few steps towards the guy ready to crash into his hand if he made a motion to draw. I disarmed plenty of rubber and unloaded guns, but the fear of permanent damage and or death puts a lot into perspective. Finally, my boss stepped out of her office to see what was going on. I honestly don't remember what the man was shouting after I saw the gun, but he had not calmed down, and I was too laser focused on his right arm. My boss was met with the same responses and roadblocks I'd gotten regarding this Michael fellow. Despite all the stuff that had been going on with her former board member stalking her, and whether or not she'd seen the gun too, my boss made the ballsiest decision I think I've ever seen. To say I'm thankful we were in sync to make this work is putting it mildly. Displaying complete control and confidence, my boss told the man, I think you might be looking for the Delaware facility, just down here and to the left. I'm sorry you were given bad directions, but it's in this complex. Let me walk you over there now, and walk him out the door and to said facility. She did. As soon as they were out the door, I knew what to do. I called the facility and warned them that my boss, who they knew well, was walking a man over to their facility, and he was armed looking for someone named Michael. Given that this facility serves a lot of patients under the Act 911, there's almost always at least one police officer there. When I saw the gun in his jacket, I came to the conclusion that this was an attempted hit on Michael. Gang activity has plagued Little Rock since the 90s, and at one point, it had the most murder per capita in the US. During the early 2000s, it calmed down considerably, but within the past five or so years, gang violence has resurged in the city. Furthermore, I've had prior experience in Kansas with gang violence when a hitman came into our middle school to kill the son of a rival gang member in broad daylight. Fortunately, he never made it inside. That means in both instances, this was meant to be a message to the other gangs. He wasn't hiding his face, he had no backup, and his face was on all the cameras. I'd guessed he already made plans to go to prison and thrive there but I don't know enough about gang life to say for certain what his follow-up was going to be. But what had me terrified at the moment was that my boss was right in the middle of the danger. I panicked after calling the facility and stayed in the office. I'm kind of ashamed I did that. My boss returned not long after. She didn't tell me anything new, only that she had led him there and thanked me for calling them. She hadn't seen the gun in his jacket but she knew something wasn't right about him when she got a good look at him from our office. She said she went mother hen mode by leading the danger away from her coop. He clearly had been given bad directions, which was mildly amusing. To be fair, just to do a Google map search of that road shows a misleading display of everything on that small street. To the left of our office, there are roughly 40 yards of trees that separate our complex from the facility. So I guess he was just coming out of the tree line as I was unlocking the door, because I did not see him coming. My boss didn't tell me about anything new the next day, and I checked police beat for weeks to see if anything was written about it. Thankfully, I didn't find anything in police beat, which means no one was harmed. However, we later worked with and trained LEOs in crisis intervention, and they would sometimes give us inside info, like 
where was or wasn't safe, where gang activity was increasing. One lieutenant I worked with a lot eventually confirmed that the man was in fact trying to kill Michael over gang disputes. I don't know what his relation was to the would-be hitman beyond that, especially why a mental health patient was a target. But hey, we may have saved someone's life. I did have some theories. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the story. And please, stay out of gangs, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a waitress at a pretty small village pub. It's pretty chill, and we usually don't get a lot of customers. So I'm the only server and bartender. The only real busy day is Sunday around noon. So my boss always stays to help me with the lunch rush. Last Sunday was pretty calm and manageable. I was taking care of the customer in the main room and garden while my boss was taking care of two large parties in the separate dining hall, since it's a small village pub in a very rural area. I know almost all of our customers, so that one guy really stood out, because I'd never seen him before. He was probably in his late 40s, smelled terrible, and had extremely greasy hair. He was just standing at the bar drinking beer, and talking to a man who is a regular, and comes in every day. The weird guy was constantly staring at me with wide eyes, biting his nails, which was already creepy as hell. And I overheard him saying stuff like, Wow, she's such a doll. I wish I could wear a mini skirt to work. That made me feel pretty uncomfortable, but still, it happens every day since I'm an 18 year old girl and most of the customers are 40 ish year old men. About an hour later, my area was pretty empty and the creepy guy was the only person left at the bar. He was still staring at me biting his nails. My boss was standing at the other end of the bar with one of his customers who was paying a pretty large bill. And when the customer opened his wallet, you could see a bunch of 100 euro notes in there. The creepy guy mumbled something in my direction and I said, Sorry, what was that? He was waving me to get closer, so I did when he mumbled very quietly, Hey, I have a great idea. What's that? He nodded towards the customer paying his bill and mumbled, We could kill this guy, bury his body in the woods, take all the money and run off together. I thought it was some kind of odd joke and awkwardly tried to laugh, but the guy didn't laugh or smile or anything. I just kind of stuttered, Oh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. He still wasn't smiling or laughing, so I just noped the hell out of there and started to do some work in the back until he left. So creepy guy, who takes things to the next level, I'm not sure if you meant to joke it or not, but let's not meet again. I had a woodshop teacher that went out of his way to be the cool guy. He would let us pretty much do anything we wanted in class, would even let us go out the side door to smoke if we wanted, and would come up to us guys and make sexual comments about female students. One time I remember him coming over to me and some other dudes with an open can of shellac, it's white and sticky, and saying, hey fellas, you know you got a good chick when she takes a load like this. He then laughed looked at a really attractive girl in class and said, Bet she does. We all kind of nervously chuckled and let out a big, What? And walked away. Years after I graduated, I actually worked with him for a short time, and he was still creepy as ever. I just found an article saying he was arrested last year for inappropriately touching three female students and providing male students with drugs and alcohol. What an awful teacher. This all starts when I began working at a grocery store in 2015. This one older man introduced himself early on to me, and I thought nothing of it. Eventually he started coming through my line every day and buying me various things. He would always tell me he was dying of cancer, 
and thought of me as the son I never had. I never gave him any special treatment or even had long talks with him, but he seemed like he was going further and further each time. Eventually, every time he came through my line, he would ask me out to lunch, which I always came up with some excuse because I didn't feel comfortable about the whole situation. And this leads up to today, a year after I quit the job. He somehow found my new address and sent me a two-page letter saying he just wants to talk and he misses me. Not sure what to do about this. On one hand, I feel bad for him and want to reach out. And on the other, I'm very creeped out how he found my address after all this time. What should I do? I'm a 20-year-old female, and four years ago, I was a high school senior, working at Chick-fil-A, and I was also ridiculously stupid and naive. So about four years ago, I started my very first job, and for some reason, my last name and first name were on my name tag. I apparently took this guy's order, Scott, and he memorized my name and looked me up on Facebook. I very stupidly added him, because it said he went to my high school at the time. He messages me, and I quickly find out that he has not only graduated high school, but college too. Now at the time, I was like, oh, this isn't weird. But now that I'm actually in college, I find it very strange that a 22-year-old was hitting on a 16-year-old. We were talking and he tries to take me out on a date to an orchestra concert that's over an hour away from where I live. I was at least smart enough to reject this idea. For the next few weeks, he keeps messaging me and I kept replying for a bit and he started asking personal questions about my age, sexuality and other stuff. But usually our conversations were very platonic. He still always comments on my looks and how attractive he found me. I slowly stopped talking to him and didn't give him another thought. Then my graduation rolls around and he messaged me again, trying to get me to go out with him on a date. But he refuses to tell me where, so obviously I refuse. So then I have completely forgotten about him until now. I currently work in a resource lounge for students in a student center for my college. One day, I was working when an older guy with grayish hair comes up and says he needs some help. I help him and ask him to put it in the computer system, and he tells me it's Scott. My mind started racing, wondering if it really was him. Sure enough, Scott decided to go back to get another bachelor's degree at my college. That's not completely weird, but I found it odd that he chose mine, and he chose to go to the resource center where I worked at, during the hours I work. What a big coincidence. I'm still not convinced it was weird yet. Well, being a college student, I also work at a retail store on the weekends, and I'm pretty much guaranteed to work every Sunday. Well, one Sunday he comes in and just walks around without buying anything, and then makes eye contact with me before walking out. Okay, odd. Next Sunday he comes in and just walks around, doesn't buy anything, looks at me and walks out. Now, after a few more times of this, I unfriend him on Facebook and hope everything is just a giant coincidence. But he quickly realizes that I unfriended him and sends me a request again. And then again, two days later, I finally blocked him. But I think this guy had bad intentions. So Scott, I can't wait for the day we no longer meet. I used to work in Sears when I was 18. I'd been there for maybe a year at that point and had a few creepy customers, but this guy takes the cake. It was casual wear day at work. I wore some black pants and a more revealing white blouse with short sleeves, which exposed some of my tattoos. I only had a Majora's mask and Triforce tattoo at this point. The creep noticed and stopped me to compliment my tattoos. We both expressed how much we loved the Zelda series. I was stupid and naive, and I wasn't the best at making friends, so I thought this creep was pretty cool. 
I basically had the mentality that if you liked video games, you couldn't be that bad of a person. I had no idea what neckbeards or nice guys or anything of the sort were at the time. And I had experiences with both. In any case, we exchanged numbers and I thought it was great I'd made another friend. When his creepy side started coming out. If I didn't message him back fast enough, he would joke that I was busy sleeping around or didn't have time for him. Or joke that he could cut himself if I didn't reply. One night he texted me saying he wished he could kill his soon to be ex-girlfriend. That freaked me out, so I blocked him immediately. The next day he came to my workplace and demanded that I unblock him and make it up to him or else. I told him no, that I owe him nothing, and he left, and I thought that was it and that we were done. I let my other co-workers know about the situation and told them not to let him near me. He came back, pushed past my co-workers into our back room, where he found me stocking the shoes. He pushed me and demanded again that I make it up to him, or I'll end up just like his ex-girlfriend or worse. I screamed and my co-workers had gotten security. I was in tears as he was dragged away and had to continue working after I settled down. The creep wasn't finished. The Sears I worked at had two levels. All the basic Sears stuff upstairs and downstairs was the mailing and discount items. The bathroom for employees was downstairs. Apparently the creep had gone into the electronics section which is besides the stairs and was posing as a customer. He followed me downstairs and into the women's bathroom, where he screamed at me and grabbed me. He held me against the bathroom wall, right before the stool and started touching me inappropriately and telling me, this is what I get. It's my fault this happened. And then to be a good girl and not scream or struggle. Of course, I screamed and struggled and thank God the male ladies could hear. Security came and got rid of him. We had awful security, and I'm not the first person to have this problem. So creepy guy who followed me into the bathroom, please, let's never meet again. Not to mention the fact that I ended up quitting not long after this incident took place. I'm older now, and I've learned not to be so trusting of others. Life, as I'm glad to say, has gotten plenty better. I am a 31 year old female, and this happened to me four years ago. I was working register at a dollar store at the time. I had a steady flow of customers, so I was fairly busy. One customer stepped up to the register and wanted to look at a portable AM slash FM radio that was behind the counter. He was in his 20s, maybe early 30s. Hard to tell because he was so rough looking. He had a tattoo on each cheek and he was acting really weird and obviously high. He wanted to see what kind of batteries it took. So he opened the package and he couldn't get the battery cover off because he would need a screwdriver. So he starts banging the thing on the counter and breaks the battery cover off. He asks me to help him figure out which batteries he needed. Meanwhile, I have a line building up and can see the customer behind him looks nervous. I was very calm and patient with him because he made me nervous too. I think that might have been what could have saved me from possibly ending up a victim myself. He eventually paid for the radio and left after me taping the back of it back on for him. After he left, me and the next customer spoke about how uncomfortable the guy made us. And that was the last time I saw him, in person anyway. The next time I saw him was on Facebook, on a link to a news article. I can't remember if it was the same day I saw him or the following one, but I saw his unmistakable face on the mugshots. He robbed and shot a local pizza delivery guy to death and then called 911 and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. I honestly feel like if I had reacted or treated him differently, or if there weren't so many customers in my store at the time, I could have been a potential victim. He was so nervous and he was trying to storm my register, which he did for about 15 minutes. 
I think he got spooked and changed his mind on robbing me. I was working in a convenience store. 19 years old, single mum. Luckily, this day, I wasn't alone. This guy came in and walked around and then went back to pump his gas, then drove off without paying. I got the tag number, called the police per policy, and didn't expect anything to come from it, because that's what always happened. Gas theft just wasn't a priority to the police department. To my surprise, less than an hour later, an officer walks in and asks me to identify the guy, which I did. I didn't really think too much of it. I was just content they caught the guy and went on about my business, went home and got on with life. The next day, the manager calls me early and tells me that she saw the guy who I had identified on the news. He was wanted for two counts of murder. He had murdered a female jogger with no apparent motive and a convenience store clerk that he had kidnapped after robbing her. I assumed he was mistaken because that just seemed too crazy. Me helping catch a murderer seemed unlikely. Later that day, the officer came by and told me it was true and thanked me. Without the tag number, they may not have caught him until he had hurt more women. She also told me that the reason the police caught him quickly was the car was stolen. Then the officer told me the scariest part of all. Coming in and walking around the store is exactly the same thing he did before the robbery and kidnapping of the second victim. I will never know exactly why he didn't rob me or worse. I assume it was because my manager was there, which was unusual. I'm just grateful for whatever it was. This was early in 2003 in a small city in the south. In any case, I'm glad I'm just around to tell the tale and to inform you that he got the death penalty. I was working at a fabric and craft store when I encountered a neckbeard. The first time we met, he was needing help getting something off a shelf and wandered to my side of the store, the fabric side. Of course, I go and help him, and it's customary to ask, what are you working on? He tells me he makes what I can only describe as nerd stuff and sells at conventions. I tell him that's super cool and that I'm a cosplayer myself and have attended many conventions. He thanks me and goes on his way. The next week he shows up on the same day and comes right over to me. We aren't busy, so we strike up a conversation about cosplaying, and he asks if I could help him with one he wanted to work on. I ask to see a picture, and it's essentially a muscle suit with a loincloth. Immediately after showing me, he jumps into, I can't pull it off though, I'm too fat to pull it off. And of course, I start telling him how cosplay is for everyone, and he can wear whatever he wants. He asks again if I can help him sometime with it, and that he would pay me a lot of money to do so. I decline, but he scribbles down his number in case I change my mind. I threw it away. The next day he comes in again. This time we're busy, and he makes a beeline right for me. And I was putting fabric away in the back corner of the store, and instantly starts berating me. Why didn't you call me? I gave you my number so you could call me. I told you I would give you a lot of money. I quickly look around. There's no one. Just me, a five foot two person, and a neckbeard who's a very big guy. I started to tell him I needed to go back to the counter, and he's stopping me and backing me further into the corner. I have no idea what to do now, or how to flag down anyone. Then I remember the headset we all wear, and just pushed the talk button, and between him yelling and me, I could say things like, Sir, I really need to get out of the fleece section and go back to the counter. Soon an employee came up and saw what was going on and said, Hey, it's time for your break. Hurry up. And she grabbed my arm and whisked me away. I had to write up an incident report with my manager, who decided not to ban the guy from the store. So instead, whenever he came in, people would use a code over the headset to let me know to go sit in the back until he left. I worked for a while, 
until one day we were really busy. I was a manager myself now, and I was running the register. I didn't look up and just called the next person. That's when I heard, wow, haven't seen you in a while. And I looked up and saw it was Neckbeard. I put on my best fake smile and said, oh, my schedule's changed a lot. I work another job now. He asked me where, and I told him in the strip mall. Of course, I wasn't gonna tell him the actual place. I thought it was over until right before he left. He put his hand on my shoulder and said, well, when you're off tonight, you should give me a call. I had to be walked to my car after my shift and I switched to overnight so I never saw him again. I still live in fear or see him at a convention sometime. I'm worried what I'll do if that happens. I'm 30 years old and I've worked as a special education teacher in an elementary school. I've been there about 10 years and have always gotten along with my co-workers, save a few minor incidents, of course. I am a very friendly person at work. I try to participate in all social events and be friendly to all the new workers we get. That's why I was so kind to Muhammad. Muhammad was 24 and moved here to North America from the Middle East about two to three years ago. He claimed to be a psychologist, but was now working in my field. Whether or not he is one, I don't know. So for the last year and a bit, we had been friendly. However, in the last few months, Muhammad became very clingy, constantly asking questions about my boyfriend, complimenting me, texting me, and updating me about his every day. Out of respect for my boyfriend, who he knew about and would constantly bring up in conversation, and my general disinterest in him when I started putting distance between us, telling him I didn't like compliments when he would endlessly compliment me, less talking, not texting him back, etc. On the week before our spring vacation, he took it another level, making comments that my boyfriend doesn't love me because he took more than a minute to reply, saying I should join him on a vacation to Miami, just the two of us blowing up my phone to the point I had to block him. All of this I could handle until the day he really pushed me by following me at the heels all day. When I wasn't in his line of sight, he would demand loudly where I'd gone, screaming my name out when he saw me walking in the opposite direction to ask where I was going. I have panic disorder as well as bad anxiety. As this continued throughout the day with a few people questioning his behavior, I began to feel a panic attack coming on. So I asked to leave early. He spent the whole week we're on vacation, constantly messaging and calling me from different numbers. I blocked them all as they came in. And since our return, I haven't even said a word to him. It's been roughly three weeks. Now he just complains to everyone how horribly I treated him and stares at me whenever I'm in his line of sight. I don't know if I overreacted or not, but at this point, I don't care what my co-workers think of me. Muhammad, you were a good friend, but you're being a creep now, and I don't want to meet again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Bonus points to those of you who are working right now, who were at work while listening to Workplace Horror Stories, you know, that's pretty cool. And got all the way to the end. Well done. I hope you enjoyed the video. And to all of those of you who weren't at work, you know, well done also. If you liked today's video, you know what to do. Get back onto the other tab and press the L key to show your support. Or even better, hit the comments section with that little mouse of yours and spam some letters and press send or enter or whatever it is. That'll be pretty cool. I wonder if we can reach 200 comments. Maybe. That'd be cool. 200 comments. I like these comment challenges. Let's do it. Can we hit 200 comments? That's my goal for today. And your goal. But, you know, just leave one a person. So yes, all is good today. I hope you had a good day. Um, certainly some interesting stories. I, I'm glad I don't work in an office anymore. 
I didn't encounter any creeps, but I'm sure some of you guys have in the past. If there is a story you would like to share, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my Reddit. And as always, a huge thank you to my incredible patrons whose names can be seen on screen. To have your name seen on screen as well as other cool and awesome prizes, check out my Patreon, which has been linked in the description. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, be wary of creeps at work, and I'll see you in the next one.